legislators behaving badly, decorum goes out the window and politics is reduced to a brawling snake pit. That's why there's such a thing as parliamentary procedure. Think of it as traffic rules for senators and congressmen. Now, since the Estrada years, our electorate's gotten a crash course in parliamentary procedure. There's no reason to think we're going to see any less of our legislators in action. So for their sake and ours, I thought we'd undertake a crash course in parliamentary procedure. I'm Manolo Quezon, The Explainer. This is The Explainer, where we explain why issues are issues. Now, our explainee tonight is someone who's joined us before, ANC writer Jackie Pascual. Welcome back to the show, Jackie. Thank you, Manala. Now, Jackie, uh, tonight we're going to be going through the motions of how they go and undertake motions in places like the House of Representatives, and we'll have a senior legislator with us to walk us through the ropes. But as we prepare to do that, why don't you invite our studio audience, and well, our TV audience, to join in the discussion? To all our viewers, join our discussion. Text REACT, space X, space your name, your question or reaction, and send to 2366 for Globe and Sun and 231 for Smart. Or you can also log on to our website at www.the-explainer.com. And we're also joined in the studio by nursing students from the College of Perpetual Health, Binyan, Laguna. And you can see they've brought their uh, little poster with them for Caduceus, am I correct? their news organization there in Binyan, and one of them apparently knows a little bit about uh, parliamentary procedure, so we're expecting some tough questions from them. So, our discussion on parliamentary procedure after this. You're 29 years old and suddenly you're the speaker of the first popularly and nationally elected legislature in our history. That was the dilemma that Sergio Osmeña of Cebu faced when he was elected speaker of the first Philippine Assembly in 1907. In that historic year, the country's legislators had to decide between two evolutionary tracks. Would they continue the Spanish system as adopted in the Malolos Congress or try the American system? The choice was theirs. They took a chance on new rules, American rules, and the speaker from a new generation. Now, the U.S. Congress, instead of the Spanish Cortes, therefore became the model for our legislature, though for a time, from 1907 to around 1922, there was also the suggestion of another model, the British parliamentary system, being adopted. Now, that issue was settled in 1916 with the creation of the Philippine Senate and a more aggressive attitude by that chamber towards the chief executive who happened to be the American Governor General at the time. Now, think of it. You're 38 years old and the first Senate president in our country's history. Manuel El Quezon, the fir that first Senate president elected with the Senate's founding in 1916, had been the first majority floor leader of the first Philippine Assembly under Osmeña. He then started another evolutionary track that would lead to a Senate with its own rules, traditions, and procedures, very different in some ways to those of the House, which is, of course, a much larger chamber. Our bicameral or two-chamber system, conscious of its American antecedents, also looked to political and cultural imagery that went back to the Senate of Rome, of all places, even as it would grapple with the pattern set for legislatures and dictatorships around the world. Now, the foundations of the rules, the parliamentary procedure governing our Congress, were therefore laid down in the period from 1907 to 1916. By the 1920s, we could see the difficulties that parliamentary procedure helped sort out. Take the sleepy-looking man you see on the right of this picture on the dais. That's Speaker Manuel Rojas, circa 1922 to 1923. Now, on one occasion, he was kicked in the shins by an angry congressman. Indeed, the 1920s seems to have been a wild and woolly period for our legislators. This Philippines Free Press editorial cartoon from the era shows the unseemly quarreling that accompanied committee assignments, for example, in the House. But another Free Press editorial cartoon this one shows another more lethal problem. Congressmen took to showing up at sessions with their guns, and their behavior became a national scandal. 
in the end, though, things sorted themselves out. And when you come to think of how passionate we are about our politics, we've maintained overall an amazing decorum in our legislative affairs. And we've established our own long-standing heritage of parliamentary procedure. Now, parliamentary procedure, or the rules governing the meetings and workings of our two chambers of Congress, has a logic all its own. An authority on parliamentary procedure, uh, Dimiter writes, and Je Jackie, can you read uh, what they wrote? Yes, Manalo. The object of parliamentary law is to transact the Assembly's business legally and to control the conduct of its members. Rules are necessary because it is dangerous to rely on the inspiration of the moment for standards of action or conduct. Hence, rules are set up for three necessary purposes. Number one, for orderly procedure. Without it, the meeting would result in utter confusion, chaos, and disorder, just as would be the case in a ball game or card game if there were no rules to go by, and each player did as he pleased. Number two, for the protection and liberty of the minority. That is why, for instance, parliamentary law provides that every member shall have the right to debate main motions, and debate cannot be shut off except by a two-thirds vote of the body, thus affording the minority freedom of speech and liberty from constraint. And number three, for the expression of the will of the majority, it is axiomatic that an assembly functions best when the majority rules. Hence, democratic self-government implies that the minority, however convinced of its own wisdom, consents to be ruled by the majority until in orderly process it can make itself the majority. So, to recap, Demeter identifies five great principles underlying the rules of parliamentary law or parliamentary procedure. The first is order, that, it, that is, uh, that there must be orderly procedure. The second is equality, that is, all members are equal before the rules or the law. Number three, justice, that is, justice for all, every single member. Number four, right of the minority to be heard on questions. And number five, right of the majority to rule the organization. Now, those are two, uh, in, in many ways, diametrically opposite principles. Now, with those principles in mind, when we come back, we'll try to simulate some parliamentary procedural problems we see on TV when we return. In Taipei, Taiwan, the leader of the ruling party is addressing the assembly. When an opposition member walks up and slaps her across the face. Punches are thrown, hats are ripped off, and hair is pulled. A full-out brawl ensues that lasts for an hour. An elderly parliament member tries to break up the fight but she faints before order is restored. That was another scene of legislators, this time female legislators in Taiwan behaving badly. Now, here's a book written in the 1960s by Inocencio Pareja, former secretary of the House. Now, it covers the rules of the House of Representatives, and as you can see, it's a pretty thick book.